This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, continuing my conversation with the man I regard as the world's greatest revisionist historian. Greg, please do continue. Okay, so what I want to do now is establish that the Paris attacks were about Queen Elizabeth II, and they were about me. And we get that through the name of the band and the people who played in the band. And the band that was playing in the Bataclan Theatre was called Eagles of Metal Death. Right? Yes, I think that's a very strange name, but indeed that was the band. Yeah, so what Eagles of Metal Death conjures up is the Foo Fighters from World War II, as well as the Nazi swastika. It's the Foo Fighters from World War II, which was the UFO. Right? See, so the, the UFO of Vrilcraft, V R I L, crashed in 1936 in Freiburg, F-R-E-I-B-U-R-G, in the center of Germany. Now, my great-grandfather, Ernest Godwood, was acknowledged as the world's foremost authority on the combustion engine in the 1930s. And he was worth about two to three hundred million in today's money, and he employed Mark Twain, a.k.a. Samuel Clemens, as his vice president. And his business was at 280 Broadway, New York. And pretty much every year, he used to take a ship from New York through the Panama Canal to San Francisco, then to Auckland, and then to Invercargill, where he had 10 children. Apparently... He died on a ship in the Western Mediterranean near Marseille on the 2nd of December 1936 where two ships collided and one, uh, the ship that he was in, he died the day before apparently on the, on the 2nd of December 1936 and then the next day the ship collided. Now in the Mediterranean you're not allowed to bury a body at sea. And when the ship collided, the, the ship he was on, which is the SS Mongolia, that was laid up for two years for repairs. So his body went missing. Now his mansion at Queen's Drive, Windsor, his patents and his fortune went missing. And his ten children, one of whom was my grandmother, were left with nothing. And they didn't do anything about it. Now, before the war, the Nazis were stealing scientists. Now, the, the, my great-grandfather's invention was the Godwood, his main invention, he invented a lot of things, including the egg beater, you know, that spins around yes. and the eggs, he invented that. Um, and he invented the um, Godwood uh, vaporizer, which was better than the carburetor. And he was getting 33 miles per gallon in 1910, um, running on petrol, diesel, kerosene, methylated spirits, alcohol, and vegetable oil. So he was a forerunner on um, uh, alternative fuels. Look, look at the regression since then, Greg. If only we had his standard available, the world would be immeasurably richer and probably ecologically cleaner. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. Um, he, was, he was also um, a linguist and a public speaker, and he played a lot of instruments and sang, and he was a sportsman. He's a champion rower, cyclist, and swimmer, and he had blonde hair and blue eyes, and he was considered a perfect Aryan male. So, as well as that, as well as being acknowledged as the world's foremost authority on the combustion engine. So he was really a target for the Germans. And... Um, from 1900 to 1910, you could learn German off the streets of New York. You know, it was give or take whether it would be a German language there or an English language. So the Germans obviously knew about him, and Mark Twain was um, was his vice president, and they were based 800 yards from Nikola Tesla, and Mark Twain was friends with Nikola Tesla, um, who was also kidnapped. Um, in 1957, and he, he lived for many more years. Um, so my great-grandfather was taken to um, 
uh, Hunneberg, Hunneberg um, in northwest Germany to back in engineer the downed Vrilcraft or UFO or Foo Fighter, which uh, is the name of a band. Foo Fighter is the name of a band. Eagles of Metal Death is the name of a band. And the number, the name <coughs> 11 is also the name of a band. And these are all related to the band that was playing in the Bataclan Theatre. And the number 11, or the name 11 for a band, refers to the German Foo Fighter crashed in 1936 and the American Foo Fighter crashed in 1947 um, in um, uh, Area 51. What's that, what's that area called? With the, um, area 51, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you know, Roswell, Roswell, Roswell. So the Roswell crash was in 1947 and it's 11 years between the two. Right? So the names of the band, the band's Eagles of Metal Death, Foo Fighters, and Eleven, all relate to UFOs. Eagles of Death Metal. Eagles of Death Metal, yeah. So they all relate to Foo Fighters, which my great-grandfather, Ernest Robert Godwood, was stolen, lock, stock and barrel, to back engineer. And they were flying by 1939 and right through the war. And they were in a physical state as metal, but they're also reported by World War II pilots as being in a light state. And in one instance, one of the Foo Fighters in a light state came through the tail of a, of a World War II plane and went right through the whole fuselage of the plane. So back then, which is about 80 years ago, they had technology that was so far advanced from what we have but we do see it in sci-fi movies. And sci-fi movies are the way that they, that the military industrial complex tells you, we've got this. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, well, yes. it's just fascinating to me how deliberately the technology has been suppressed to make engines less efficient, consuming more oil and gasoline for the benefit of the companies. I mean, it's... It's yeah. like the Tucker, you know, when he created a better car, uh, Detroit uh, crushed him as a company to get it off the market. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, Eagles of Death Metal is uh, a, a really terrible band. It's appalling. They are really bad. They're really bad. The comments they get on YouTube on their... Um, on their speaking in tongues video is this shit is so fake is anybody buying this crap they're part of this whole war on terror bullshit their music sounds like somebody made it up in a hurry it goes nowhere and they've made a million photos of themselves this band is fake we better wake the fuck up people something's going on and then eagles of death would be a better name or we suck even better <coughs> I mean, they're really terrible. They're, they're really terrible. And one of the one of the one of the songs written by um, one of the musicians when he is um, thirty six is uh, when he's thirty four. Um, Josh Hughes wrote this song called "I Got a Feeling Just 19. and it's like a pedophile's grooming song. You know, look it up. It's just utter crap. But here's the correlation. Um, Eagles, because we want to establish, you know, is, is the Bataclan theatre attacks related to the Queen, right? Related to Queen Elizabeth II. So the Eagles of Death Metal drummer Josh Holm is the longest standing and only continuous surviving member of the band Queens of the Stone Age, 1996 to 2015, where he was lead vocals, guitar and keyboards, not drums. And Queens of the Stone Age had Dave Grohl as the drummer, 2001 to 2002, and Jack Black joined for the Queens of the Stone Age Memorial Concert in 2008, when a band member died. And uh, Jack Black is also on Dave Grohl's Foo Fighter 1999 Learn to Fly video. So the people who played in Eagles of Death Metal also played in Queens of the Stone Age and also played in the band Foo Fighters. Right? All yep. of which either relate to me as the great-grandson of Ernest Robert Godwood 
or to Queen Elizabeth II. Now, Jack Black was the vocalist and guitarist of Tenacious D with Dave Grohl on drums and in the 2001 movie Tenacious D, Dave Grohl played the devil. And Tenacious D is homophonous with the Mossad motto, Audacity, Audacity, Audacity. Tenacious D, Audacity. Right? So it's a, Tenacious D is a Mossad band. Right? And Jack Black has, has got a Jewish mother. He went to a Jewish school and his father is a Judaic convert. And the, the audacity idea is to simply be so overwhelming and blatant, no one would believe it could be done this way. I mean, if that's a an aspect of make war by deception, audacity. Yeah, but the Paris attacks are audacity, audacity, audacity. They got Mossad written all over them. Yeah. Yeah? Now, um... And the look at the, this photograph, Greg, which is on page 15. It's yeah. allegedly in the theater, but it looks phony. It looks photoshopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? So tell I've, tell I've, me about that. Well, I've added, I've added some text on the back, which reads, um, Mossad officer training, audacity, 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 graduation bash, 11, 13, 15, Bataclan. Um, no, no cell phone photos. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. I mean, no, it's clearly no, got no to be phone. staged. No cell phone photos. Yeah. So what I've done is I've, I've identified um, all the Jews, and a lot of the people who were active crisis actors in the audience are wearing red or orange. This guy yeah. in the front's obviously Jewish, and he's got a red and orange band in front of him. Right. Yeah. And this woman here next to my finger is wearing devil's horns. Right? Uh, I don't know why that corner... Oh, that's a different photo, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a different photo. It's on page 17. Yeah, yeah, let me yeah. go down to so it. So she's yeah. wearing devil's horns. And then in the movie Tenacious D, Dave Grohl plays the devil. Yeah? And yeah, um, yeah, I see the devil's horns. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, uh, Jess Hughes' nickname is the devil. He's called Jess the Devil Hughes. Right? So you got two guys in the band and they, they play in each other's bands and they, they go in each other's um, uh, well, YouTube movies. And two of them are called the devil. So one's the devil and one's Satan. It's kind of Was this actually is. supposed to be a Mossad officer's training graduation match? That's what it is. If you look at the people, you can see some people in there that are so completely Jewish. If you look at the two guys there, here, yeah, look at the size of the noses on them. But have, have, I don't know. This has made it into the major media that this was a Mossad party. Yeah, because they're getting audacious, right? And the very reason, audacious. I mean, this is simply outrageous. The reason they're getting audacious is because two weeks before the Paris attacks. David Cameron gave British intelligence to the Mossad. You are kidding. No. I'm not. What in God's name? That's a betrayal of the crown, Greg. Uh, it's, a, it's a betrayal of everything. And that's why the... It's a betrayal of England. That's why the, um, the newspaper articles, the subheadings on page 1 and 4 and 5, read like this. Intelligence failures that cost dear. That's... Uh, yeah, I'm looking. See that? Uh, yeah. Intelligence yeah. failures that cost dear. Okay, and another one goes... Um, um, a new test for adversary with total self-belief. So David Cameron has total self-belief and he's... It's he is the adversary, and then zombie-like killer. The, made the adversary. Adversary, yeah, adversary. Sorry, what, you're right, what, you're right. what? What? What is wrong with this man? And then, and then this one here. Yeah, mastermind. Mastermind despised and disowned by his own family. Right. That's referring to David Cameron. 
who, who a few weeks prior had been published as the Kushan sticking his dick in a live pig's mouth. Yeah? Yeah. But the pig represents the Jew. So David Cameron's got his dick in the Jew's mouth and they can bite his dick off at any time. That's how controlled he is. And David, Prime Minister of, of United Kingdom, David Cameron, has just handed over British intelligence to the Mossad because they have total control over David Cameron because he is um, compromised and mind controlled. Totally. Is Cameron another pedophile? Uh, worse, worse. He's covering up for the pedophiles as well. Uh, it's just like, you know, if you, all of the hopes you had for. Palace of Westminster, the British government, the British courts and the monarchy, invert them. And then that's where you've got reality. Just invert your expectations. Yeah? Greg, um, it's, 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 it's beyond bizarre. It's beyond, it's beyond bizarre. It, it is. Okay, so, so here we are now. I'll read, I'll read out the correlation between the, 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 all of these guys are friends. They all play in each other's bands and they all go in each other's movies. So Jess the Devil Hughes founded and plays in Eagles of Death Metal, Foo Fighter, and is the longest reigning member of Queens of the Stone Age, seeing Queen Elizabeth II back to the Stone Age. Hughes also plays in Them Crooked Vultures. The Foo Fighters founder Dave Grohl plays in Queens of the Stone Age, Them Crooked Vultures, and Tenacious D, Audacity, the band, and acts as the devil in Tenacious D, the movie. And there's the devil in the picture there on the... Uh, Left hand side there, or right hand side. Yeah, it's got yeah. different forms on the woman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, the Jewish Jack Black is code for the prince who came from nowhere. Jack Black is code for the Jack of Spades, which is code for the prince who came from nowhere. And for the last eighteen months, I've been just you know just walking past, and a street magician will appear. And they've just been pulling out the Jack of Spades out of nowhere, you know, just repeatedly. Different magicians, it's just all the time they pull out the Jack of Spades, which means the prince who came from nowhere. And there's Bible codes for this, and it means um, the prince who came from a brother nation. And this is you. That's me, yeah, yeah. So the Jewish Jack Black, code for the prince who came from nowhere, played in Queens of the Stone Age, Tenacious D Band, and the Tenacious D Movie. And Tenacious D is homophonous for audacious, audacity and audacious massage. And that is total audacious massage. They're having their um, officer training massage bash. And then they're going to turn it into an audacious staged phony attack. Yeah, yeah. Which is also dethroning the Queen. So, because what happens is they do, they do an exercise which was uh, done in the morning, which is all the police and ambulance in case there's an attack. And the police and ambulance and rescue squads is the hospitaliers. It's the old Templars hospitaliers. So the Templars were in on it. And then they have the real attack in the evening, as they do again and again and again. So they all do cameo cameos in each other's music videos and movies. So it's a tight click with the two devils, which is... Um, uh, I think it's Josh Hughes and um, and uh, uh, um, Dave Grohl. They're both called the Devil. Well, they play the part of the Devil. One ring to Satan. Um, so the Eagles. But, but, but Greg, was that announcement that there was a Mossad officer train actually up there at the theater? No, no, no. I actually put that. I put that on and. All right, that's what I, I wanted to know. That no, seems so but, strange. It, yeah. It, it, just, just might as well have been there if it was a sign. Might up. as well have been, yeah, if it yeah. Was a okay. Sign up, it wouldn't have made any difference. So the Eagles of Death Metal band is code for audaciously and tenaciously send Queen Elizabeth II back to the Stone Age. But here's where it gets even more interesting. The Eagles of Death Metal audaciously and tenaciously sent Queen Elizabeth II back to the Stone Age becomes more pronounced when Jess the Devil Hughes made a 2004 solo album called. A pair of queens. So it's about the queen again. And Joss Holm featured in the 2005 Queen, the band, Queen tribute album called Killer Queen. With the song Stone Cold Crazy, 
and he played with the band Eleven. The difference between 1936 and 1947 is 11 years. It's been the two Foo Fighters, one in Germany, one in America. And Joss Home featured in the 2005 Queen tribute album called Killer Queen with the Stone, Stone Cold Crazy with the band Eleven. The I call it the Paris Gullibility Shock Test. Did you skip that? Did you skip that Sheer Heart Attack album? Yeah, well, we, uh, uh, I might have. I might have. Hang on. The pa I call it the Paris Gullibility Shock Test on 11, 13, 15, where the lyrics of Killer Queen were carried out 88 days after Queen Elizabeth II was struck with a black wand. So I struck Queen Elizabeth with a black wand, and I did that as. Um, Lord Guardian, Arch Treasurer of the Royal Secret. So I struck her with a black wand on the 17th of August. And then the did, that, did, that, did that occur only symbolically or did that occur physically? No, I did it in the courts. I, I lodged documents and registered in the courts. I had a case going since um, the 14th of April. So the striking with a black wand wasn't a physical black wand, it was a legal wand. Uh, yeah, it's a legal wand, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you can do okay. it with a physical wand as well, um, but the ones who have done it traditionally with a physical wand have actually been the monarch's agents. <laughs> and, and, and may or may not have had much of a life thereafter. Yeah. So um, the lyrics of Killer Queen were carried out in the Paris attacks. And they read like this. She keeps Moe and Chandon in her pretty cabinet. Let them eat cake. She says, just like Marie Antoinette, that's referring to the French royalty, a built-in remedy for Khrushchev and Kennedy. At any time an invitation, you can't decline. So there's the Mossad officer training bash. Caviar and cigarettes, well-versed in etiquette, extraordinarily nice. Chorus, she's a killer queen, gunpowder, gelatine, dynamite with a laser beam. Guaranteed to blow your mind any time. Recommended at the price. Insatiable and appetite. Want to try. So this 1974 song, Queen's 1974 song, which is off the Sheer Heart Attack album, was like preemptive band programming where they modeled the Paris attacks on Queen's song. On Queen's heart, Sheer Heart Attack song. With the song Killer Queen, they used gunpowder, gelatine, and dynamite, or appeared to. Yeah? Guaranteed to blow your mind. And the Paris attacks did blow everyone's mind, even when people uncovered that it was fake. And then when uncovered that it's a whole series of codes, it still keeps blowing the mind. Um, so... <clears throat> Yeah, so it's 18. So it carries on. She she kept the same address. She met a man from China. So she spoke just like a baroness, met a man from China, went down to Geisha Minor, then again, incidentally, if you're that way inclined. Now, met a man from China in the Bataclan operetta, the three French people were dressed in Chinese clothing, pretending to be Chinese. And throughout the play, one Frenchman said, well, I'm actually French, and then took off his Chinese disguise. And then the next person says, well, well I'm actually French, and, and took off their Chinese disguise, you know. So the song actually says, met a man from China, went down to Geisha Minor, then again, incidentally. So it's actually saying that it's about two French people and China, right? And then again, uh, and then it says, the lyrics, perfume came naturally from Paris. It Greg, all this Paris. is so obscure on its face, I don't think anyone else in the world could interpret it as you're doing so here. And what, you're saying uh, it's too wild or it's it's accurate? No, it's just, you know, it's creativity, artistic license, they put this together. I mean, uh, I'm not disputing your interpretation. I'm saying it seems to me you're virtually the only man in the world who could have figured this out. Yeah, well, that, and that actually did occur to me, um, but, you know, it's, it's to see if the Paris attacks are about Queen and uh, the bands all play with UFOs and the bands all play with Queen 
and in a band called The Queen and they did tribute songs called Queen and they did a tribute album called Queen and the tribute song Killer Queen talks about perfume in Paris, met a man just, in China, gunpowder, gelatine and dynamite, you know, it, it actually... Just, just offhand, did anyone die in Paris? No, no, no one died in Paris attacks. No one died in the Paris attacks. But 56 people die every 24 hours in Paris on average. So, you know, they had license to say 56 people have died. And then the next day at one minute past midnight to say 112 people have died in Paris. And the day after that, they had license to And say, that's just because of the natural or accidental occurring deaths in Paris, not to do with the event. Yeah. And the Isn't the, that something? I know, it's bizarre, because they say in Paris, you know. And you but you see, didn't even confirm the numbers, and the numbers would verify that that many people had died in Paris, leaving out the part that it wasn't because they were killed by terrorists. <laughs> well, if you get, um, so if you say, if you say, so there's 100 and, 168 people die in Paris every three days, right? And they finally ended up with a number like 129 or 140 people died in Paris. And that, that's giving themselves the number that die over about 66 hours. Yeah? Yeah. Because you've got you to look at what the media is, right? And the media is infotainment. The media, the news is not the news. Its brief is infotainment. It does not have to be accurate at all. And it is not accurate at all. Right. There ought to be a law, but yes, I understand what you're saying exactly. And and that's, of course, particularly true of television reports. Oh, where, the, you know, more propaganda and disinformation is transmitted in less time than ever before in world history. Yeah, it's called depleting emetics. So um, they have, they start off with all the same stories, so it's all the same channels, and then you've got different various medias putting out contrary stories so that it doesn't stack up in your head and your head gets tired very quickly when things don't add up and that's called depleting emetics and it means that you lack an interest in the story and you lack an interest in investigating the story um, and that's what's happened is that that um, people got switched off a lot of people took the initial shock and said okay so 140 people have died in paris um, I'm sympathetic, where can I send money, and then switch off, you know, and other people go, hang on a minute, none of this stacks up, they're all just reticulated dummies, and um, it's, it's a Mossad officer training, audacity, audacity, audacity bash, with the people who play in um, Tenacious D, which is homophonous with audacity, and they're all been in Queens of the Stone Age, or Foo Fighters, or Eagles of Metal Death, or Eleven, and the, the, the Queen's Killer Queen album describes the Paris attacks, and so the whole thing was preemptive programming. It's just like, you know, when Bart, Symptoms, Bart Simpson's on the front cover of a magazine, and he's pointing to the Twin Towers, and he's got 9P, and it actually reads 911. Yeah? Yes. I mean, yes. That's preemptive programming. Obviously, they, you know, those creators knew that it was going to happen. And it, it appears that the band Queen either knew that the Paris attacks were going to happen or that the Mossad and the other intelligence operations, including America and Britain and Germany and France and South Africa, based the attacks on Queen's Killer Queen album to label Queen Elizabeth II sent back to the Stone Age because... I had struck her with a black wand and made a successful challenge to the throne. Yes. You know? And they have not been able to block this in the courts, right? Because if the courts are committed to protect the queen, you would presume they would have simply refused to accept it. You would think. Like, if, they had, if the British courts had any integrity whatsoever, they would say, we don't have any subject matter jurisdiction, please go elsewhere. Right? Instead, what they did was they got two incredibly corrupt judges. They used um, 
Well, first of all, when I, when I lodged it in the Worcester court, I didn't know why I lodged it in Worcester, other than I was, I was living in Hereford at the time. But um, about 200 yards down the road from the Worcester court is where King John I is buried, who um, signed the Magna Carta. Right? And um, uh, Queen Victoria's firstborn son, Prince Marcos Manuel, he became King John II of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland from 1869 to 1910. And what I've been doing with my work is, it's called Purifying the Sword, where I've been correcting the history. So I've corrected the history of the Duchy of Saxon Coburg and Gotha, and therefore the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, Gotha, and therefore purify the sword of the Duchy of Saxon Coburg and Gotha, which is the second or third house of the British royal family, supposedly. But we own the sword of the Duke of Saxon Coburg and Gotha. So we own the second house of the British royal family. And we also own the um, second or third house, the second and third house we own. We also own the um, Principality of Hanover. And uh, so we've got the Royal Chalice marking that and the Royal Seal. And so what I'm doing now with the um, uh, approaching the British courts to be recognised as the Prince Pretendant of the Throne and Crown of the United Kingdom from 3pm on the 1st of March 2015 is I'm purifying the sword of King John I, who's got a shocking reputation, purifying the sword of King John II, who was barely acknowledged as a king, except that on his coronation day on the 6th of October 1869, which is St Bruno's Day, that Queen Victoria also opened the Holborn Viaduct and Blackfriars Bridge. So you've got 100,000 people walking over these bridges every day, right? So you've got 100,000 people acknowledging King John II of England every day. Yeah? Implicitly, unknowingly. Yeah, well, they know now. They know now, right? So um, what I'm doing is, is as Prince pretended to the position of King John III, um, this, these Paris attacks have effectively confirmed the House of Joseph and they've confirmed for the fifth time, this is five, the fifth time <laughs> I've been confirmed as the Prince pretender to the throne and crown of the United Kingdom in three dimensions, in 3D, in actions, because the courts are useless and the courts will do anything that the British monarchy wants them to do because they swore an oath to the Queen. Right? But the Queen actually wants to abdicate to me, and she has abdicated to me, um, with the laws of succession, which she backdated in 2014 to 25th of April 2013, which is Marcus Manuel's birthday, um, 179th birthday. And it's also the, um, the day in which I was registered as a member of the Star family, which places me above Queen Elizabeth II. So Queen Elizabeth II has actually acknowledged me as above her. So she's required to abdicate to me, and if she organised the Paris attacks to acknowledge me, she could not have done a better job. That's just stunning. It's just stunning, Greg. <laughs> so, what, um, I know this, um, how do you call them? It's not a super soldier, it's way above super soldier. And um, he says to me, it's, it's not the people, it's the people beneath the people stopping you getting to your position that you have to worry about it. So Queen Elizabeth II could be going, okay, well, look, you know, he's obviously predicted, he's, he's got all the material, he's written the books, he's got 40 royal marks, He's created, he's affected the laws of succession. I've backed out of the laws of succession to acknowledge him. I'm acknowledging him as much as I can, and everyone beneath her will sabotage. So they won't even defer the Queen's wishes because they prefer the status quo to what might succeed her. Um, there's another rule which I mentioned earlier, but I forgot to, to, to mention it. Um, it's that um, the British royal family and the European royal families, because I'm a member of the staff family, they cannot say anything against me. 
They cannot say anything against me. And the word say comes from assay, A-S-S-A-Y. And that means they can't judge me, they can't put me on trial, they can't say anything negative against me, they can't belittle me. They can't say anything against me. You know, it's so fascinating, Greg, because here in the United States, there's utter lawlessness, there's no decorum, there's no propriety, no one respects any tradition, any legacy, not even the Constitution. So it's, it, there's something about the, the purity of their adherence to these constraints that is utterly remarkable to me in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, straight after the Paris attacks, the next day was the Lord Mayor's show, which is the Lord Mayor of London's day where he puts on a big show. And um, it was massively cold, severely cold that day. And it was raining and they had all the blue black security out and not many people turned up and there was no fireworks. Right. And on the, also on the same day, but in Perth, um, Charles Wales, Charles Prince of Wales, had his 67th birthday in Perth, which is a it's a warm place, Perth, and it's in November, so it's the beginning of summer. Summer, and he had rain and lightning. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're all getting sabotaged. And the reason they're getting sabotaged by nature is. They've flipped everything on their head. They've got a fake royal family sitting on the throne. Queen Elizabeth II was not crowned on the coronation stone because the coronation stone was stolen two days before. When Queen Elizabeth II was born in 1926, her mother was not a mother. Her father was not a father. She was conceived by artificial insemination. She was born above a pub. And the BBC went public the same year to promote the commoner Elizabeth as a princess and as a queen. And the reason they did that is because the people that own the Bank of England, the Rothschilds, particularly Mayor Amschel Rothschild, he made a prediction in RAT in the Rothschild Archive Trust. That's what's kept. He made a prediction that said from the time of his death, which turned out to be 19 September 1812, for 200 years or so, basically the Rothschilds would have control of the British royal family and would breed into the British royal family. And that ends around the 19th of September 2012 or so. And then after that, the secret is allowed to come out. And I was predicted to bring out the secret in about 1837. So they write down all the criteria of me. So I do that and bring out the secret. So what's happened is that that generation's illegitimate, that generation's illegitimate, that generation's illegitimate. That's actually a mistake there. That that's illegitimate, that generation's illegitimate, that generation's illegitimate, that's illegitimate, and that's illegitimate. So by the time you get to Queen Elizabeth II, she is five times illegitimate over five generations. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth II yeah. is actually the most illegitimate person in the world. <laughs> Greg, how can, how can the royal court historians, of course, when you have a hereditary monarchy, yeah. they're focusing on these issues of genealogy, have got it so wrong? Well, what's what's amazing is I go into the um, London Book Fair, Fair in April this year, 2015, and they, boy, but they did not want to know me. They absolutely did not want to know me. I got into the royal section and there was this woman there who was selling books of photographs of the royal paintings in Windsor Castle. And those paintings are actually owned by the British public, but they, they're stored in Windsor Castle and, you know, you can maybe see them, maybe pay to see them, but you can't see all of them. And she was on a show very recently in the last couple of weeks talking about um, the relationship between Queen Victoria and her husband, actually her second husband, Prince Albert. And they were literally sitting around a table making shit up. <laughs> they were actually making stuff up. And the way they cut it, it sounded like, you know, it was a little bit of contentious, but they all agreed with each other. And the same with the Royal Bogfists. They just make stuff up. 
Now, Princess Beatrice was Queen Victoria's secretary, and she hand-copied all of Queen Victoria's diaries when Queen Victoria died. She hand-copied them, edited them vastly, took all the saucy bits out, took all references to her firstborn son, Prince Marcos Manuel, out, rewrote them, and burnt all of the originals, which is about 70 years of diaries. Right. And all who, of the, who, who, all who, of the, undertook the, who undertook that project? Princess Beatrice. Yeah, Queen Victoria's youngest, right? So now well, you got all these raw biographers who are going by Princess Beatrice, who was a PR agent to, to make the British royal family appear legitimate, and they're all going smugly, yeah, 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 we got this right, because we got Queen Victoria's diaries. But Queen Victoria's diaries don't exist. It was the biggest history-burning in recent history. She took the real diaries and rewrote them. Rewrote them and burnt the originals. And weren't the originals in Queen Victoria's hand? Yes, they were. So, obviously, the rewritten were in Beatrice's hand. Yes. But have they sought a comparison of the handwriting? Um, no, because they just make shit up and they don't investigate themselves. <laughs> it's just you know, they, just, they just take it as a given that these are authentically victorious and never even entertain the conjecture that Beatrice could have perpetrated a fraud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've got, we've got confirmation that Queen Victoria was married to, if you can see it, to uh, blind King George V of Hanover because Queen Victoria held on to the crown of Hanover for 29, almost 30 years. Right? So just imagine, like... Her father-in-law, her real father-in-law, is the King of Hanover from nine, uh, 1837 to um, 1855. And Queen Victoria's got the crown of Hanover, and she won't give it back. And the King of Hanover does nothing about it. And then his son, who's actually Queen Victoria's first husband, he reigns for seven years as the King of Hanover without the crown. And then after seven years, Queen Victoria gives him the crown of Hanover. She kept the crown of Hanover because she was actually the queen of Hanover. But and of course, we're talking about the physical crown. The physical crown. They actually stick yeah. it on your head crown. So right. how, how do you get crowned? <laughs> how do you get crowned king of Hanover? When you don't if you don't crown, have the crown. the crown. you know. So, you know, that was a very contentious, unexplained piece of history. What about the theft of the coronation stone two days in advance? How did that come about? Has well, it ever been has it been returned? Two years in advance, no. Um, that was stolen um, by four Lewishmen, which means the sons of Freemasons. One was a girl in Scotland, so the university guys, and they stole it in on at four p.m. on Christmas Day, nineteen fifty. Right. And then they, they took it to Scotland and supposedly broke it on the way. And then they, they gave it to a, a, a Scottish Freemason who was a stonemason, and he made a duplicate. But the duplicate was 122 pounds lighter. Right? And then they, they wrapped the duplicate up in a Scottish frat flag, contacted the, the British authorities and said, the, the, the um, coronation stone is here wrapped in, a, in the Scottish flag. Come and pick it up. So the British grab the fake coronation stone, take it back to Westminster for Princess Elizabeth to become crowned Queen Elizabeth II on. But it's a fake. And everyone knows that Queen Elizabeth II is a fake because she was born above a pub by artificial insemination. And George yeah. VI... What? What were they doing stealing the stone in the first place, given its enormous significance in British history? Um, the door was open. The door to Westminster Cathedral was open. So they just walked in. Yeah, but, I mean, what motivated them? You know, was this like a prank? Um, no, no, they were instructed to by Freemasons, by their, their fathers who were Freemasons. And... Uh, they, in turn, were instructed by the Stuarts because the Freemasons worked for the Stuarts to put the Stuarts on the royal throne. And the 
they were given instructions from the Rothschilds to steal the coronation stone because by 1852, it was another 60 years before the end of the Shin or Forbidden Secret where the Rothschild royal families would be discarded from the throne of England. So they had to start delegitimizing more obviously the British royal family. Right? So not, not being crowned over a coronation stone is a good way to delegitimize Queen Elizabeth II. But all of these generations of kings were illegitimate. Like Queen Victoria was the daughter of um, Baron Jacob Maeder Rothschild, who was French, but she legitimized herself by marrying the second in line to the throne and then having a child, which was Prince Marcus Manuel, who became King John II of England in 1869. And then that's the legitimate crown line. So to continue the illegitimacy, Queen Victoria, in her second bigamous marriage, married Albert, who's not Albert of Sachin, Coburg and Gotha, he's actually Albert of Saxony, which means he's illegitimate. And then Lionel Nathan de Rothschild, who owned the bank in London, he actually put Queen Victoria under Baron Dungo and had nine illegitimate, bigamously born, slow children. And then the slowest, maddest, and nuttiest of them all was um, Bernie, Prince of Wales, who became King Edward VII. And he was in a horrible relationship with Alexandra, Princess of Denmark, right? So they go back to Denmark. Um, Bertie, Prince of Wales, goes to Sweden on a hunting, rooting, shooting expedition, which is actually what they called it. You'd go out hunting, shag some woman, and then um, eat more, basically. That was all he did. And what well, Hunting, like, shagging, eating? That's what it was called? Um, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so as um, eat, eating. Yeah, he'd, he'd basically go out hunting in the morning, he'd, he'd shag a woman, and then eat the whole day. That was all he did for his whole life. Seriously, that was all he did. If you read the, the you know, royal biographies. So they, they took um, Bertie, Prince of Wales, to, um, from Denmark to Sweden, which was nine days away. And he was away for 21 days, which ensured that he could not be the father, right? Meanwhile, Alexandra, who's Danish, Alexandra, Princess of Wales, she has a relationship with um, Tsarevich Alexander, who becomes Tsar Alexander the, the Third of Russia. And they have a child who becomes King George V of England. Right? And 1929 to 32, his aide de camp was um, Vice Admiral Sir Theodore John Hallett. Now, George V marries Mary. And he realizes that his son, George VI, is slow. So he arranges George VI to go to New Zealand to have sex and have a child with the most sacred woman in New Zealand, Guy Rangi. And that becomes King George VII, who's actually George VII of England. And I was introduced to him by King George VI and Queen Elizabeth's doctor in 1967, and at the same time they changed the currency of New Zealand from British pounds and pence to New Zealand dollars and cents. Um, so that King George VII, who's George Fitzradama, he's actually the legitimate King of England because George VI was not the father of Queen Elizabeth. It was, he was replaced because his first child born in 1924 was um, epileptic, a son, so they left it to die on the gurney, hospital gurney, and then George VI was replaced with Winston Churchill's sperm, and Winston Churchill is the son, illegitimate son of King Edward VII, so he's half royal, but he's also half American, so, <laughs> which means that Queen Elizabeth II here is a quarter American, and the, this, this woman here, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, right, she supposedly came from um, uh, Glam's Council, or Glamour's Council. But she, she was engaged to Edward VIII for a week, and he said he was going to abdicate. So then the next week, she became engaged to the person who became King George VI. But Elizabeth Bowes Lyon realised that George VI was uh, one IQ point above retarded, 
had the attention span of a gnat, had knocked knees, he's an alcoholic and a chain smoker. So Elizabeth Bell's lion scarpered and replaced her with her maid, and Elizabeth Bell's lion's maid, who comes from Ireland, married George VI. And then Winston Churchill's sperm into Elizabeth Bell's lion's maid via artificial insemination produced the half Irish quarter American Queen Elizabeth II, who was born above a pub in uh, the Coach and Horses pub in Mayfair. She was so illegitimate that the BBC, which was a private organisation started in 1922, as soon as she was born in 1926, the BBC was bought by the British government and went public. And the BBC's role is to promote the multiply illegitimate Queen Elizabeth II, or the ultimate. The multiply illegitimate Elizabeth Mountbatten, maybe, as a princess and as a queen. So she's so fake that when her father, George VI, died, or well, just before he died, he was sick in, in uh, 1950, Christmas Day 1950, the true royalists, the Stuarts from Scotland, they send their sons down, their Stuart sons down, with Rothschild blessings, who own the Bank of England, to steal the coronation stone so that Queen Elizabeth II, when she's crowned over a fake stone, is even more fake. So you're looking at the most fake royal in history. The most fake. Without a question. So she abdicates to me. And she has uh, Charlie well, and Anne. Most, most fake but has had one of the longest reigns. Yeah, except I struck her with a black wand um, uh, 23 days before she reached that longest reign. And then her being struck with a black wand and dethroned is all codified in um, the Bataclan Theatre, the Bataclan Operetta, the names of the bands, Eagles of Death Metal, Foo Fighters, Eleven, um, Killer Queen, Queen, Pair of Queens. And the Pair of Queens refers to this guy, uh, Philip Mountbatten, or Prince Philip, who's illegitimate. I didn't mean to cut off uh, you were going from... Queen Elizabeth II to others there on the chart. So what happened What happened here? They're, they're trying to make it as obviously as illegitimate as possible. So Lord Luna Batten, he arranges the marriage of his nephew Philip, who's got two suits and 20 pounds, to marry Princess Elizabeth, who's um, apparently wealthy. And then they run this as a heroin trafficking sex slave operation. And Prince Charles is born as a sex slave with Lord Louis Mountbatten extorting Elizabeth into marriage with Prince Charles born a sex slave with Lord Louis Mountbatten and then Anne and then this whole thing here with Prince Philip, Lord Porchester, and Lord Plunkett and Lord Louis Mountbatten is a heroin trafficking unit called the Triumvirate and they use Queen Elizabeth II is the heroin trafficking mole, and to keep her quiet, the heroin trafficker Lord Porchester sides with Elizabeth Prince Andrew, who's up on pedophile charges, and they get the heroin trafficker Lord Plunkett to sire a child with Queen Elizabeth, who's called Prince Edward. So you've got this heroin trafficking sex slave extortion unit of massive illegitimacy, and then Prince Charles. Um, is dating Camilla when he's 16, her 18th birthday, they sire a child, and that's Simon Charles Day, and then he marries a black woman, and they have six black children with five surviving. So you've actually got a black illegitimate royal family down here as well. Who <laughs> are the great-grandchildren of the massively illegitimate Queen Elizabeth II, who never had the longest reign, was never crowned, has never been queen, has never been a princess, has never been a royal, and is a massively illegitimate commoner. And Prince Philip, who's a German DVD, Deutsche Werdekunstdienst Nazi, Lord Lohm Batten is a Nazi, he's a German Nazi, and Deutsche Werdekunstdienst means for them the war never ended. So the first stage of the game was to get Prince Philip to marry Princess Elizabeth and have children. And the second stage of the game was for Prince Philip to get... Ted Heath in as Prime Minister, he's a homosexual, uh, uh, sorry, he's a um, bisexual pedophile child murderer, Prime Minister Ted Heath. 
and he was heavily compromised by Prince Philip and Lord Lumbert Batten, and in 1973 got Britain into the European Union. That was the mid-stage of the game. And then the third stage of the game is Prince Philip is introducing all of these fake claimants to the throne to cover up the true claim to the throne, which is indicated by the letter and by the series of books, The Hidden King of England, Anna Christie and Bailing the Rose, which Queen Elizabeth II and her agents have fully acknowledged by not allowing the books sold in any bookshops, in any chains, in any independent bookshops, and having her uh, British Army 77th Brigade trolls, it's called 77th Brigade, Army trolls attacking me on Facebook and attacking the websites and sabotaging interviews so that no one can read the Hidden King of England series to find out that this royal family is fake, this royal family is true, and I'm Lord Arch Treasurer, and that, that means I act for the King in England, and because of the legal case and the acknowledgement and Paris attacks, um, acknowledging the Queen and me um, as the son of the Foo Fighters, really, creator, um, as the um, Prince Pretender and Tenant King. Tenant. So it's ten eights, you have four eights, three eights, two eights, one eight. It's ten eights, which means tenant. Tenant, tenant King it means Tenant King, which is which is like acknowledgement of certified Prince Pretender, one step above. Greg, in the few minutes we have that remain, I'd like you to let everyone know how they could <laughs> obtain copies of your book. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, um, the website, theworldoftruth.net, and thehiddenkingofengland.com. I tell, I tell you how much. How much, uh, um, what do you call it, censorship they've put on these books. They've allowed me to sell one set of books in England about every six weeks. So it's five books every six weeks. And is that to maintain the pretense that they're not actually banning the book? No, it's to, it's to you still hope you're going to sell some, so you fly them over and you bring them in, and you still run with the program of selling books, but there's there's less than negative money in it. That's what they do is they, um, they they well, it's basically suppression. It's it's just total suppression, and they've turned a lot of people who were actually close to me into army trolls, and there's been quite a bit of sabotage, quite quite a lot. I'd say there's been as much sabotage in England as there was. In New Zealand. That's appalling, Greg, but considering the stakes, yeah, the I'm stakes. really not surprised. The hidden king of England dot com. Yeah. Yeah. So what it what happens is um I'll try and I'll try and get you a visual on this. Um if you see you see that, so you got the ten eights, you've got the eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight. Well it's all in the it's all in the article. Yeah. So what happens is um, if you get the, the eights, the ten eights, and you put them one below the other, that's actually a DNA strand, right? Understand that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you, you put the eights on the side, and that means infinity, right? So what happens is you get um, these, these codes. So 8888, 888, 88, and 8. Read vertically as a DNA strand. And the 10 is code for Rex DNA strand. And the, um, the 88888, 888, 88, 88, and then 88 and 8 is uh, written as infinity, so it's 10 infinity symbols. It's code for Do God's adopted son, which is a Bible prophecy. And the Bible code mm. for the Rex DNA strand uh, is in Ezekiel 2127 and in Revelations 217 and 1715 and it reads like this oh, yeah okay Got a few minutes squeeze it in okay it reads like this i will overturn destroy and make a ruin of a perverted world until a perverted throne of david is no more when he whose right it is comes i will hand it to him he that overcometh shall inherit all things and shall be god's chosen adopted son selected from thy countrymen's brothers and made a king who rules wisely 
Put more simply, the Bible code reads like this. Uh, the Bible code for the numbers 8888, 8088, 88, and 8, and the Rex DNA strand of 10 infinities is the world will fall to ruin. The tenant prince will be, 10 8 means tenant, the tenant prince will be handed the kingship on a silver platter, as it was in the Bataclan operetta. This prince will overcome all obstacles and inherit all things. God will select this prince from a brother commonwealth nation and render him a wise king. That's what they're actually working towards. They're actually trying to manifest this prediction and make it happen. Um, so what happens then is uh, yeah. we have the claims, etc., which is... Great. You never <laughs> cease to astound and amaze me. This, this is Jim Fetzer thanking my extraordinary guest, Greg Hallett, for being here and all of you for watching.